Thank you, um, and welcome everybody. And I want to thank the organizers of this, as well as President Daniels and Dean Clagg. Um, I'm actually charged with talking a little bit about some of the epidemiologic background and the medical aspects of this particular disease and trying to tie it into what uh, Dr. Peters just discussed, and making the argument that by improving care, we can also improve engagements in the community. So just to remind everybody, this is one of the viral uh, hemorrhagic fevers, of which there are many. This is a phylovirus um, coming from the French word ficelle, or uh, a string. And there are two viruses in this particular family, both Ebola and Marburg. Um, Ebola's name actually came from the Ebola River, which is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it was first discovered in 1976. There are five species of this virus, um, all of which reside in Africa except for Ebola restin, which has primarily been found in the Philippines. And that is the one virus that actually does not infect humans, as far as we know. Um, Zaire, or the Zaire strain, is certainly one of the most feared of these and associated with very high mortality. The outbreaks primarily began in Central Africa, as identified by the purplish circles. And, um, this is where most of the experience of the 20 plus outbreaks that have been reported worldwide has been garnered. And it is actually relatively recently that this has emerged in West Africa. And in fact, this actually started in a, around the area of Gekadu, and um, I think, yeah, which is right here at the corner of where Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia actually come together. And the index case is thought to have been a two-year-old boy. Um, and if you look at this picture, what you can see is a cartoon of how transmission occurred moving from Gekadu throughout Guinea, as well as then into Sierra Leone and, and Liberia. So a nice chain of events, if you will, with transmission and moving from uh, very remote areas into urban sites. And that is one of the most notable features of this particular outbreak. This is one of the few. There has been one other in an urban area. Uh, to date, and these numbers are changing all the time, there are thought to be over 8,000 suspect cases. Um, most, uh, almost half or a little bit more have been confirmed and about 4,000 deaths. The country that's been most hit, uh, affected by this is Liberia, but um, also significant cases in both Sierra Leone and Guinea, as you all know. What's most important is most of these cases have really occurred in the last three to four weeks, and the burden of this particular outbreak is increasing. So in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the outbreak is actually a separate outbreak. Um, and it began in the equatorial province where um, in the area very similar to where some of the original outbreaks occurred. It began with a pregnant woman who butchered a bush animal that had been killed and given to her by her husband. Since then, they've had 71 cases. It does appear that the outbreak is slowing down. They've had 43 deaths with this. Now, what I'd like to talk about now is a little bit about the clinical presentation of this. This um, disease presents very acutely, usually six to 10 days after exposure, but up to 21 days. Um, very nonspecific symptoms with fever, weakness, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, severe headache. It sounds like the influenza, and that's one of the big challenges, is it sounds not only like influenza, it sounds like malaria, it sounds like typhoid fever, it sounds like a lot of things that you see in this part of the world. Um, hemorrhage, as most as we think about, is really not as dramatic as in the movie Outbreak. Um, what you see is ecchymoses, sometimes petechia, even a rash that looks 
but uh, to have frank hemorrhage is actually pretty rare. And even in this outbreak, it's less than 15% of the cases. And it's not gross exsanguination that is really leading to death in these patients. This is a cartoon, really, of how the disease progresses with these very nonspecific um, symptoms that occur early on. Then you move to the more hemorrhagic phase, but just to reemphasize that it can be very minimal. Um, and then between 6 and 16 days is when people declare themselves, and they either can progress into a much more fulminant form of the disease with shock, or they can move into a phase where they have clinical improvement, which is really actually thought to be partly associated with an immune response. Now, what I'd like to do is argue that we need to move away from just isolating patients. And I would like to show you some data about very basic medical care and make the argument that this is like HIV, where we argue that we can take um, and HIV drugs into Africa and improve outcomes. And I think we can take simple medical care into Africa and improve outcomes. So this is um, data. There is an outbreak of Marburg hemorrhagic fever with an extremely high case fatality rate of around 87, 88 percent in Africa. When these cases um, came into more um, developed healthcare systems and people were given simple hydration, what we saw is a dramatic decrease in the mortality. Um, in Kikwik, which is one of the more famous of the Ebola outbreaks, there is a case fatality rate of close to 80 percent with the first uh, set of cases that occurred. The last 25 patients received intravenous fluid resuscitation and the case fatality rate dropped um, between 30 and 40 percent. So there is also now emerging data from these particular outbreaks that with IV fluid resuscitation, even and the excuse me, the use of um, electrolytes without being able to measure electrolytes. So we're just giving people electrolyte supplements and empiric therapy that the case fatality rate in the camps where they've tried this or the ETUs, the Ebola treatment centers, has actually dramatically decreased. There are investigational therapies also that have been talked about in the Western world. I'm not going to dwell on these because somebody later in this symposium is going to be giving a much more erudite discussion than I can give. But just to note that these have not really been used in Africa. They've primarily been used here. Uh, now, the second component of this is how do you get transmission? And I um, fully believe, I mean, you will never get anybody who works in infection control not telling you that we must do infection control. And I absolutely believe that isolation is going to be part of what we have to do to break the chain of infection. This particular infection, the transmission through breaks in the skin, mucus, membrane exposure, and exposure with needles. Um, you know, initially, as I mentioned, you can get infection from eating bushmeat or an infected animal, but the transmission that's human to human is really via contact and direct contact with um, the, the secretions, whether it's sweat or blood, et cetera. Um, there is no evidence, really, of airborne transmission with this particular uh, virus. It can be aerosolized by our, some of our medical treatments, but at this point we don't think that at least the Zaire strains is aerosolized. Um, so the risk of transmission, what do we know about this? Uh, so as I said, there have been 26 prior outbreaks. All of these have actually been terminated with pretty simple barrier precautions. A lot of what you're currently seeing has not been needed to terminate these outbreaks. It requires a, much, a very assiduous attention to making sure that your PPE is appropriate, but it doesn't need to be super complicated. Um, now, what do we know about these? Well, in Kikwik, which is one of the, the outbreaks where we have the best data, 16% of household contacts developed Ebola. 
29% who had direct contact with cases and their fluids became infected, but no household members who had no direct contact became infected. So I think that's one of the messages that we can dispel, is that if you don't have contact, you're not going to become infected. Now, interestingly, in this outbreak, 80 of the cases, so 80 out of the 315 were healthcare workers, and the epidemic was interrupted by the institution of very simple barrier precautions and intensive training. And this is an epidemic curve from Kickwick. Here is where they implemented the barrier precautions. You can see that there were cases for about a week after the implementation that would fit with the fact that these people were incubating. There was one isolated case, oh, by the way, the black bars are healthcare workers, where there was transmission, and this particular healthcare worker admitted to rubbing her eyes. In terms of Uganda, what have we learned? 26 laboratory confirmed cases, and the specimens were tested using RT-PCR. Um, they actually found that you can find virus in many of the um, bodily secretions. So you can see saliva, skin, stool. Semen is important. This can actually uh, continue for up to 90 days after you, um, you, uh, you get better from the infection. But what I found most interesting about this study and the reason I present it is that among the environmental isolates, none of the um, isolates were positive from non-bloody specimens. It was truly the bloody specimens where you could isolate this in the environment. And then finally, there is a very famous case from a um, Johannesburg hospital, an unrecognized Ebola case that came in and recovered. The patient had upper and lower endoscopy during their care, and an anesthesia assistant put in a central line. This assistant remained undiagnosed for 12 days. Um, and had many, many procedures that you would actually see commonly in a hospital. Lumbar puncture, hemodialysis was intubated, um, and actually ultimately died. And despite this, they had no secondary transmissions. So what about Spain and Dallas? You guys are going to say, well, Trish, what happened there? And what I can tell you is that there's a very dangerous moment when you undress. And this is not a healthcare worker issue. This is really a systems issue. But when you get out of these isolation units, you're tired, you take off your protective gear, you're sweaty. And, and remember, it's about 115 degrees in, the, in, in these suits, especially if you're in Africa and you take off your glasses or you just touch your face like that. I mean, it can be something as simple as that that can be um, uh, almost devastating in this very unforgiving disease. So what do we do? Well, what do we want? We want to identify cases, as David Peters mentioned. We want to triage these cases. We certainly want to put in place infection control, and we want to train people about doing it. I'm not going to dwell much on these. I think David covered this well, but just really wanted to point out that this outbreak has been complicated by a lot of human factors and di distrust not only of the government, but of medical care providers. And by improving outcomes, I think we can improve that distrust. The, the other human factor in terms of medical infrastructure, I mean, these are rudimentary, overcrowded hospitals. I don't know how many of you heard the piece on NPR this morning about the initial case in Liberia and the challenges with isolation. There is a lack of personal protective equipment. Sometimes it is reused and not appropriately cleaned. And um, sometimes it's even makeshift. And just to give you a sense of this, here's from the MMWR last week where they talked about challenges with supplies of non-sterile gloves, um, obstetrical gloves that were depleted or absent. There are ma not many hand-washing stations. Um, the hand-washing stations consist of water jugs, and even sometimes those are scarce. Their supplies of soap, bleach, and alcohol gel are depleted. And you have, as I mentioned, rudimentary isolation facilities. 
Um, David really dealt with some of the challenges with the cultural habits that have complicated this. So let me just summarize by saying this is an acute viral illness, but from my perspective, what is remarkable about this is that this after SARS, MERS-CoV, H7N9 is one that really has impacted healthcare providers who are just doing their jobs. And I think that these, all of these are examples of failure of infection control. Um, and this is something that, it's not sexy. I mean, it's just about doing it right. It's like learning how to drive. And we have to really start thinking about paying attention to how can we drive down this road a little bit better. Um, to regarner the kind of respect that we, uh, or not respect, but the kind of trust that we need in the medical care, I think we have to change the paradigm of care, look at these data about hydration, and integrate those into the public health response, um, and start talking about not only decreasing transmission by isolation and um, prevention, but also by decreasing mortality. So thank you.